сегодня мы заседаем, начинаем нашу утреннюю сессию а, с первого доклада о транскатетерной а, имплантации клапанов. А, докладывает Нейтан Таргет, мы ее приняли. Спасибо. Пожалуйста, Нейтан. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I hope that this will be a little bit more interesting as I've had a, a nice long sleep last night. So I'm excited to talk about transcatheter valve replacement in congenital heart disease. This uh, new technology, which has been around for, um, available for about uh, six years in the United States now, came out of a need uh, to, uh, to identify less invasive approaches to treating valve disease and congenital heart disease. The problem is that um, pulmonary valve replacement, as we learned yesterday, is a very common part of surgical treatment of patients with congenital heart disease and is involved in several different types of heart defects, including tetralogy of Fallot, pulmonary atresia, truncus arteriosus, and others. The surgical conduits and valves that we have are very good, but they don't last forever. Eventually they fail and they need to be replaced, and each operation um, after the first becomes progressively more and more complicated from a technical standpoint. So there's a higher risk with subsequent operations. So finding something that can help us avoid repeat median sternotomies and open heart operations uh, certainly would provide value to the long-term treatment of our patients with congenital heart defects, particularly those with pulmonary valve disease. So the most commonly used valve in the United States uh, that became available in about 2010 is the Melody valve. Uh, it is taken from the vein of a neck of a cow and the, uh, the valve in that vein is treated and sewn inside of a, a platinum iridium stent as shown here. This is a video that shows the valve design and animation from the company. And we can see that there's the stent on the outside, and inside there is a, usually a tri-leaflet valve, a well-developed valve from the neck of a cow um, that is thin. This, um, this valve is the same type of valve that has been used in the Contegra conduits that, have, that surgeons have implanted for years. It's delivered through a catheter, typically through the femoral vein, sometimes through the jugular vein. And the delivery system that we have for this is 22 French uh, in diameter, so that's about six and a half millimeters. That does limit somewhat the size of patients in which we can use this technology. And there's a retractable sheath, if you look here, that covers the valve during its positioning or during its advancement through the skin into the blood vessel and protects the valve from damage or from uh, moving. The stent itself is mounted over a balloon. It's actually a double balloon technology, a balloon inside of a larger balloon. And the outer balloon uh, has three different diameters of 18, 20, and 22 millimeters. Although there have been reports of this valve being implanted on different size, sized balloons uh, up to 26 millimeters. This is another animation showing how the balloon, uh, or the stent is mounted over the balloon here the sheath down below then is advanced over the stent to protect it again during its uh, entry into the body and positioning. So the initial trial, the initial U.S. trial um, prior to approval of this technology involved children and adults of at least five years of age. Uh, they had to be at least 30 kilograms in weight and uh, it was performed only in patients who had circumferential surgical conduits. So it was not at that time placed in patients who had bioprosthetic surgical valves or in patients who had um, a native outflow tract such as a transannular patch. In order to qualify for placement of the Melody valve, patients had to have um, a demonstrable conduit dysfunction. If they were symptomatic, they needed a mean gradient across their right ventricular outflow tract of at least 35 millimeters of mercury or moderate or severe pulmonary valve regurgitation. In patients who are asymptomatic, um, the criteria were a gradient of at least 40 millimeters of mercury and severe pulmonary regurgitation with evidence of right ventricular enlargement or dysfunction. 
There were 99 patients that qualified for inclusion into this study. The mean age was 21 years, so we're talking in general about older patients, which makes sense, patients who've had an operation already on their right ventricular outflow tract and have had time for that valve to, uh, to degrade and to function poorly. Most patients, not surprisingly, had tetralogy of Fallot, which included pulmonary atresia with VSD. Uh, a smaller proportion of patients had a Ross operation for aortic valve stenosis. This first column shows the baseline um, hemodynamics in this patient population. The second column shows the change or the improvement in hemodynamics after placement of the melody valve. Not surprisingly, the gradient from right ventricle to pulmonary artery improved significantly among all patients. This included those with pulmonary stenosis as their primary problem, as well as pulmonary regurgitation as the primary problem. Likewise, the right ventricular systolic pressure improved significantly from before to after valve implantation. I'd like to present a case of ours of uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation in a 14-year-old female. Uh, this is a young lady who came to us from Iowa, which is a state to the south of us. She had a history of detransposition of the great arteries, and she had a Lecomte maneuver with arterial switch, uh, as shown here. This is not her um, image, but this is another angiogram from a patient with a Lecomte maneuver, where the right ventricular outflow tract is anterior to the aorta, and the branch pulmonary arteries straddle over the front of the aorta. She also had uh, stenosis of her neopulmonary valve and so subsequently had undergone a pulmonary valvectomy. So she had obviously severe pulmonary regurgitation. This is an echocardiogram that was performed, a couple of images showing her uh, right ventricular outflow tract here. It's difficult from this image to get a sense of the diameter of the outflow tract, but with color we can see the red color tells us that she has severe pulmonary regurgitation the blue flow is anti-grade flow across her right ventricular outflow tract, and she did have stenosis at that time with a mean gradient of 45 millimeters of mercury. So on both counts, with severe pulmonary regurgitation and with severe pulmonary stenosis, she would qualify for transcatheter valve implantation. This is a four-chamber view with her right atrium, right ventricle, and then the, her left heart over here demonstrating severe right ventricular enlargement but with preserved systolic function. An MRI was performed that demonstrated again severe right ventricular enlargement and from these images we could obtain a, uh, a right ventricular end diastolic volume which was over 200 centimeters per meter squared. And in general, in adults when we talk about pulmonary valve replacement for pulmonary insufficiency, um, we tend to uh, favor surgery or transcatheter implantation if the volume, the end diastolic volume of the right ventricle is 150 to 160 mil uh, cc's per meter squared or greater. So she certainly qualified for valve implantation based upon these criteria. So one of the first things that we do, uh, particularly when we're dealing with conduits or native outflow tracts, is we want to take a look at the coronary arteries and their relationship to the, the place where we want to put the melody valve. The reason is because as we stretch the outflow tract and as we dilate the conduit with stents ahead of time, there is a risk of coronary artery compression, which can be catastrophic. So here it's difficult to see from this projection, but from the lateral view, may not play there, but from a lateral view we can see that we have a balloon in place dilating her pulmonary outflow tract. Um, there is a waste that tells us that it would be a reasonable place to position a melody valve. And with full inflation there, we see that her coronary arteries, which were re-implanted because of her transposition, come off lateral to the conduit and are, at, uh, and are not at risk of compression. So one thing that we've learned uh, over time is that the melody valve, even though it is on a stent, is not a strong, uh, the stent itself is not a strong support for the valve by itself. Uh, we've noticed that when we don't put in stents ahead of time, that melody valve can become compressed or the, or the stent can fracture, leading to dysfunction, early dysfunction of the valve. Uh, 
And so as a result, the recommendation now is to pre-stent the outflow tract uh, with one or more bare metal stents to provide what we call a landing zone for the melody valve. So here on the right, we placed one open cell bare metal stent and inflated it to approximately 20 millimeters in diameter here. Um, we look for recoil as we deflate the, the balloon. So if the stent inflates fully, but then as we deflate the, the balloon, it recoils somewhat to a smaller diameter, then we put in more stents until we don't have any of that recoil. So we put in a second uh, stent here. Now a closed cell bare metal stent within the first one inflated it again to approximately 20 millimeters in diameter and at that point we felt that this was a good place to position our melody valve. We then went up with the delivery system of the melody valve. You can see the cone at the tip of this ensemble delivery system. This is the stent with the melody valve on it and uh, the inner balloon, so remember there are two balloons, the inside balloon which is a smaller diameter is inflated that allows us and gives us the opportunity to reposition the valve exactly where we want it to be. Now you'll notice that this stent is at an angle to the previously placed stents, but that's not a problem as long as the edges of it are positioned appropriately. It will reorient uh, in a straight position, as we'll see here. So with inflation of the outer stent, the melody valve is placed ideally within the previously placed stents, and uh, we're very satisfied with this uh, result. We, prior to, um, prior to placing the melody valve, we performed a 3D rotational angiogram as shown here from a, an AP and a lateral projection. You can see the pulmonary outflow tract, which was narrowed. You can see dilation of the main pulmonary artery from the chronic pulmonary stenosis and regurgitation. After valve implantation, the outflow tract has a much better diameter, wider diameter, and the stent is perfectly positioned where we want it to be. At baseline, her right ventricular systolic pressure was 57 millimeters of mercury, and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure was 19, so she had a gradient under general anesthesia of 38 millimeters of mercury. Following melody valve implantation under general anesthesia, the gradient was 15, which is a perfectly acceptable result, and she had nearly normal right ventricular systolic pressures. She also had an increase in her pulmonary artery diastolic pressure uh, and a larger difference between her pulmonary artery diastolic and right ventricular end diastolic pressure, suggesting uh, a relief of her, um, a resolution of her pulmonary valve regurgitation. This was the echocardiogram that we performed the next day before she was discharged from the hospital. Uh, shows excellent position of that stent and the melody valve and we see anti-grade blue flow across the valve with no significant pulmonary insufficiency. And the mean gradient at that time while she was awake of about 20 millimeters of mercury. So it does tend to be higher when children are, or when adults are awake as opposed to when they're under general anesthesia, but still a very good result. This was about three years ago now, I believe, um, and she's had uh, persistence of an excellent outcome. She still has very mild pulmonary insufficiency and a mean gradient of around 20 millimeters of mercury. Now, even though this is a very exciting technology and generally a very safe procedure, there are risks with this procedure, of course. We've talked about the risk of coronary artery compression. When we're dealing with circumferential conduits who have been in, that have been inside the body for a long period of time, they can become calcified and very rigid. And as we dilate them, we're at risk of tearing the conduits and causing uh, bleeding. In addition, um, in larger conduits uh, or in areas where we can't position uh, stents easily, the melody valve may not hold position and could uh, come out of place. We have not had this complication at our institution, but it has been reported elsewhere. Now the risks of the device themselves, we talked about stent fracture and the need for pre-stenting in order to support the melody valve. There's also risk of thrombus on the valve, and this can lead to pulmonary uh, embolism. And then another thing that's important to keep in mind that we are learning more about is the risk of endocarditis, which is probably higher than the, the risk of endocarditis for surgically placed bioprosthetic valves. These are some images not from our institution, but demonstrating the importance of uh, assessing 
the location of the conduit relative to the coronary arteries. So we do what is called coronary artery compression testing or predilation. Um, and it's something that it's a step that cannot be skipped and we have to do it. And this is why, because when we place a balloon in a position where we want to put a melody valve and we inflate it to a diameter that we want to um, inflate the melody valve to, we can see compression of the coronary artery as shown here in the second image. This is the proximal left coronary artery showing near complete compression with a nominal inflation of this balloon. When the balloon is deflated, the same coronary angiogram shows patency of the coronary artery. So this is not coronary artery disease, this is compression, extrinsic compression from uh, the dilation of the balloon. So in this situation, we would not put in a stent and we would not place the melody valve. In the U.S. trial of the 99 individuals that underwent um, catheterization to place the melody valve, four of them were found to have coronary artery compression on testing. And what we've learned over time as the valve has become more available uh, and more widely used is that patients who have baseline abnormalities, uh, anatomic abnormalities of the coronary arteries, or if they've had to have had the coronary arteries reimplanted, are at higher risk of compression. So, for example, patients who have transposition who have had coronary artery reimplantation, or patients who have had a Ross operation for the same reason, uh, are at higher risk of coronary artery compression, and they, in particular, require very close attention prior to placing stents and uh, transcatheter valves. Al almost always, on patients who have uh, conduits uh, or native outflow tracts now, we do a CT angiogram ahead of time to get an idea of where the coronary arteries are located. That said, uh, at the time of catheterization, we still assess the coronary arteries just to be safe. So there is a small but recognized risk of tearing circumferential conduits as we prepare them for the melody valve. Um, and in the initial report, about, there's a risk of about 1-2% to 2 of conduit rupture. Fortunately, these patients tend to have a lot of scar tissue around their outflow tract, so even when there's a tear, it, it is not usually catastrophic. And we have technology such as covered stents that we can put inside to cover the tear and prevent um, ongoing bleeding. So many of these patients, even with a conduit tear, can continue the procedure and ultimately receive a transcatheter valve if the appropriate measures are taken to treat the tear. Melody valve stent fracture we've talked about, um, and this is something that, uh, that emphasizes the importance of pre-stenting. But even in the presence of pre-stenting, such as this patient of ours, which had, I think, at least two stents placed before the melody valve, a uh, fracture can occur. This is an angiogram at the conclusion of the initial procedure showing the darker stent here inside of some lighter stents um, in position. We were, we were satisfied with this result initially, but I think within a year or two, he came back and there's clearly compression of uh, the stent now with probable fractures at either end. And you can see the dynamic compression with each heartbeat of the, uh, of the melody valve. In retrospect, looking at the melody valve here, you can appreciate some very slight um, compression of the valve, even at baseline, which is probably a big part of what led to the stent fractures over time. This is a still image of the same patient showing the melody valve, which is a darker stent because of the platinum, inside of a couple of other pre-placed stents. And if you look closely, you can identify several spots at which there is fracture of the melody valve structure that led to um, the, uh, the dysfunction. So this patient underwent, I think, uh, additional stent implantation and repeat melody valve implantation. With stent fracture, it can cause stenosis or regurgitation. On occasion, you can have significant stent fracture that, do, that does not uh, adversely affect the function of the melody valve. Um, in the initial report, after three years, there was significant fracture in 20% of patients. Now, keeping in mind that these are patients that were placed inside of surgical conduits, and for many of their patients, there was not pre-stenting performed. So we hope and we're confident now that this rate of fracture is much lower with appropriate placement of stents ahead of time.
inside of bioprosthetic valves and when there's been pre-stenting, the risk of fracture is significantly lower. And um, it's the risk of, of uh, fra stent fracture is, pr is present particularly in those who, who at the time of melody valve have a severely stenotic conduit, which makes sense. It means that we have to dilate the conduit significantly, um, which uh, implies that there's a lot of extrinsic compressive forces that we're battling against. So the recommendation now is aggressive pre-stenting to prevent recoil of that conduit back to a smaller diameter. Endocarditis is something that we've uh, learned about with this valve as well. The risk was about 2% over two and a half years of follow-up. So that was a risk of a little bit less than 1% per year. We think that with more data, the risk is probably a little bit higher, somewhere between 1% to 2% per year, as I mentioned earlier. On occasion, it requires that we remove the valve surgically. Uh, but in the majority of cases, when, when uh, identified early enough, we can treat it medically and they may not need um, repeat pulmonary valve replacement. So when we place these valves, we're concerned if there's an unexplained persistent fever in the absence of any symptoms uh, that, that might explain what it's from, or if we see a loss of integrity of the valve without stent fracture. Now, we can have pulmonary stenosis or regurgitation not related to endocarditis, such as with valve thrombosis that has been uh, reported as well. But we should be concerned about endocarditis in situations like that. So I'd like to share another case. This is a little bit different, uh, a little different use of the melody valve, but one that we're becoming more and more familiar with. This is an 18-year-old female who has a history of Epstein anomaly. She had multiple operations for tricuspid valve repair. She had a re-repair of her tricuspid valve at a young age, VSD closure, and placement of a bidirectional cable pulmonary anastomosis. In 2004, she underwent tricuspid valve replacement with a 25 millimeter mosaic porcine bioprosthesis. At that time, she had heart block and had a pacemaker placed. All these procedures were performed at a, a separate institution from us. And she came to us with progressive severe pulmonary valve insufficiency, and the question was, how can we treat her? This is a transthoracic echo showing her right ventricle, her surgical uh, tricuspid valve bioprosthesis, and uh, on color, the red is flow across the valve into the right ventricle with a gradient of nine millimeters of mercury, and then there's severe blue retrograde flow, which is tricuspid valve regurgitation. So what should we do? The concern from our surgeons, of course, is that she's already had four median sternotomies, and a fifth time median sternotomy, as I'm sure our surgical colleagues can explain, is a very complicated operation, let alone the, the actual replacement of the tricuspid valve. There's a lot of data su to suggest that tricuspid valve replacement uh, is not always an easy procedure, and so to add onto that the complications of multiple open heart operations ahead of time uh, increases the risk significantly. The valve she had in place looks like this one, a Medtronic mosaic valve with that's 25 millimeters in nominal diameter. And there's, uh, there are apps for iPhone and other phones that can tell us what the inside diameter of that valve is, but it's about 22 millimeters. So what we elected to do was transcatheter tricuspid valve implantation using the Melody valve. This is an angiogram with a wire across the tricuspid valve. This type of valve has radiopaque markers at the top of the struts, so the valve itself is mounted down here. And so this angiogram demonstrates severe right ventricular enlargement, which actually has pretty good function for a patient with Epstein anomaly, and severe tricuspid valve regurgitation with this contrast uh, going retrograde into the right atrium and into the IVC. So, um, here is um, intracardiac echo. So this is a catheter that has an ultrasound tip on it, uh, and it's positioned within the right atrium. Here is the surgical bioprosthesis. We see the leaflets of the, of the valve are thickened and limited in their mobility. And with color, here we can see the red this time is regurgitation, so severe tricuspid valve regurgitation. The blue is antegrade flow across the tricuspid valve. 
and the mean gradient again as we estimated on transthoracic echo is about nine millimeters of mercury. So because there is already a bioprosthetic valve in place, we do not need to pre-stent. The, the valve itself, the surgical valve, helps to protect the melody valve and, uh, and minimizes and potentially removes the risk of melody valve fracture. So we position this both angiographically uh, and with ec uh, intracardiac echocardiography. We can see here the balloon with the inner balloon inflated positioned across the surgical prosthesis. When we're satisfied with this position, the outer balloon is inflated as shown here. We have the distal end just beyond the struts of the valve. The proximal end is within the right atrium. And we see at the conclusion of this inflation a nice waist or narrowing in the middle telling us that the valve is secure in place and won't, uh, won't embolize or fall out of place. Angiography in the right ventricle afterwards demonstrates little to no tricuspid valve regurgitation. And this is intracardiac echo again, showing now within the old surgical valve, a new melody valve with thin leaflets that open nicely and there is essentially no regurgitation and a mean gradient of three millimeters of mercury. So this is old data from ours from a few years ago. At the time we had done 27 of these procedures. Now we've done 34, but with similar results. The majority of patients have Epstein anomaly, and this is because uh, our institution is a referral center where we get a lot of patients with Epstein anomaly. But there are other defects as well, including um, non-congenital uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation. All of these patients, I should emphasize, have a surgical tricuspid valve in place. Uh, we have, but only under rare circumstances, implanted a melody valve or other transcatheter valve in the absence of a surgical bioprosthesis. These are the, um, the four, or excuse me, the patients who had tricuspid stenosis um, prior to melody valve implantation. And among this group, they all had a significant improvement in their, in their gradient at the time of catheterization. On average, the baseline gradient was about nine millimeters of mercury, and afterwards, on average, it was four. The echo gradient improved as well. So the echo, the Doppler gradient prior to valve implantation uh, in all cases came down significantly. On average, the echo gradient had been 11 and afterwards was again down to about four after melody valve implantation. So among this first cohort of ours with 27 patients, uh, 21 of them had at least moderate regurgitation at baseline before valve implantation. None of them had greater than mild regurgitation at latest follow-up. We have follow-up uh, now probably up to about nine years uh, in, after valve implantation. We have had two patients who have required either repeat melody valve implantation or surgical valve replacement. One patient had an acute thrombosis of the valve two weeks after implantation. That young child underwent surgical tricuspid valve replacement and likewise had early failure of that bioprosthetic valve for some reason that we don't completely understand. We had another patient who also had thrombosis of the tricuspid valve with possible endocarditis around 15 months after implantation. So what we've done more recently is we have a much lower threshold to uh, start Coumadin, Warfarin, after um, tricuspid valve implantation. And in all patients we start aspirin probably for life. I'll conclude with just a couple words about another valve that we have available in the United States that is, it is gaining more favor. This is a valve that was originally designed for transcatheter aortic valve implantation, uh, the Edward Sapien valve. It can be placed and is approved for use in circumferential conduits 
in native outflow tracts with a transannular patch or in surgical bioprosthetic valves in the pulmonary position. This is a patient of ours just showing the, uh, the implantation within a pulmonary valve prosthesis and as this plays through you'll notice that it foreshortens a lot from the proximal end um, which affects how we position the valve. Hopefully this will play. So at full inflation we can see that uh, this is within a 29 millimeter bioprosthetic valve. We have excellent position of the valve and a very nice result. The advantage of this of the Edward Sapien valve over the Melody valve is that it usually does not need to be pre-stented, although often we do that anyway. In addition, it has an expanded um, spectrum of, of uh, um, sizes so we can put them in larger conduits and larger bioprosthetic valves and on, in some occasions in native outflow tracts. Whereas the Melody valve was limited to about 22 to 24 millimeters, we can go up to about 29 millimeters with the Sapien valve. I think that will conclude my talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Спасибо, Нейтан. Пожалуйста, вопросы к кардиологу. Рубен Арлович, пожалуйста. Can I speak Russian? Да, да, может по-русски. А, правильно я понял, что после трансандулярных пластик можно ставить Эдвардса? After valve plastic? After transannular patch. Oh yes, yes, it's approved um, after transannular patch. И были ли у вас случаи? У нас просто совсем недавно был случай, когда между ячейками престентинга застряла доставка и не смогли ее достать. Были ли такие случаи? Our very good question. So, is there the question as I understand was have there been instances? between when you place a stent to placing the valve or you haven't been able to place the valve ultimately. Our, our experience with the Edwards valve is, is recent. Um, we have limited experience. We have not had that experience yet. The only patients where we have used it have been in those who have bioprosthetic valves, so we have not had to pre-stent. Um, but absolutely there have been reports from other institutions where placing a stent ahead of time, they either could not technically advance the delivery system uh, across the stent or through the stent uh, or they found that the area is too large for implantation of valves. So that has happened, yes. Еще вопрос? Пожалуйста. Очень интересное сообщение. Спасибо большое. Скажите, пожалуйста, тактически. Вот показали очень интересный случай с транспозицией, аневризматическое расширение легочной артерии. Были ли случаи дыхательной недостаточности в результате сдавления бронха? И если такой случай будет, что делать? Будете простентировать или же все-таки предпочтете открытую операцию одномоментную? Um, so, obstruction of the bronchus with the stent yeah. implantation. Very good question. We have not had that problem. Um, when you, that does occur though when you are stenting the left pulmonary artery particularly because of the course of the left pulmonary artery over the left bronchus, you can cause obstruction of the left bronchus. Um, a lot of institutions, several institutions will often perform bronchoscopy with balloon dilation yeah. to see if there's obstruction and then that will help them determine whether to place a stent. But in the main pulmonary artery and in the RBOT, we haven't seen that as a problem. Okay, thank you. Объясните, пожалуйста, чем объясняется бакендокардит биопротеза? 
Yeah. You have to pull me. Um, we, <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think that we believe that that our endocarditis risk will be lower just because we're placing it in the cath lab. In fact, we know that that's not the case. We know that the risk is probably the same uh, that it is with surgeons placing it. So there is a balance, and we talk about this with our patients of risk. There is the risk of surgery uh, after multiple sternotomies versus the risk of endocarditis, uh, which is ongoing throughout the lifetime. Um, we are hopeful that we can treat a lot of these cases medically with antibiotics, but that's not always the case. So no, we, we, we are under no, um, we have no misperception that we do it better than surgeons do it, except that we're avoiding a sternotomy and a, and a, a bypass operation. Frank? The patient is in the hospital usually one day. The, the, patient, the patient is usually in the hospital for 24 hours and goes back to work two days later. So, so the, it, it's an important conversation to have with patients when you are deciding on the best choice of, of treatment. Risk of endocarditis being a big part of it versus a one-day stay in the hospital and avoiding a median sternotomy. Mm-hmm. That's a very, very good question. Um, the question for Frank was, um, uh, with, with what prosthetic valve, does that remove the risk of coronary artery compression? And if you've, done a, if you've gone through testing for a melody valve and there is compression, do you advise them to place a conduit of bioprosthetic valve? Um, I didn't show it here, but we have had instances where the, the struts of the bioprosthetic valve can move with balloon inflation. So in theory, there can be a risk of coronary artery compression depending upon where those corners are located. That said, I can't think of a time where we have not been able to place a melody valve inside of a bioprosthetic valve because of coronary compression, to answer your first question. To answer the second question, I think we would certainly add, our, our surgeons prefer bioprosthetic valves anyway, and we would certainly advocate for one um, with coronary artery arrangements that are high risk assuming that we should be able to place a melody valve in the future, even in that situation. You agree, Frank? Nathan, извини, у нас просто уникальная ситуация, ты не часто появляешься здесь, поэтому тебя помучим вопросами, не против, да? Я жду, а, Фрэнк? I think even after we place a melody or a sapien valve, we are saving the patient from at least one surgery, but they may need subsequent surgeries. But like you said in your talk, when you get to four sternotomies, five sternotomies, hopefully this decreases that chance. Спасибо за сообщение. Вы говорили о том, что у вас был, было осложнение в удаленном периоде имплантации в виде тромбоза клапана. Вы могли бы поделиться опытом, каким образом вы боролись с этим тромбозом, потребовало это хирургического лечения, и какой вариант медикаментозного лечения вы применяли для борьбы с этим осложнением? I think that Epstein anomaly presents a unique risk of thrombosis of valves um, because of poor diastolic function of the right ventricle. Uh, in addition, some patients have a glen which reduces the flow across the valve and in these lower flow states, these patients are probably at higher risk of thrombosis. Um, our preference has been to treat everybody with aspirin. Um, more and more, I think we are inclined to treat with warfarin uh, for three to six months after valve implantation. Um, we have had success treating with warfarin 
uh, both in the pulmonary position with thrombosis and in the tricuspid position with thrombosis so that we've been able to avoid either transcatheter intervention or surgery. Um, that said, we have at least one patient, excuse me, who had, um, who did have to have surgical valve replacement, so it's not 100% of the time that we can treat it medically. Um, we actually have placed the melody valve in the tricuspid position in one Russian boy from Rostov, and two days after surgery he had moderate insufficiency and an increased gradient without a good explanation. We treated him with warfarin, which was stopped probably about a month ago, and that would be about six months, and he's done very well with very mild regurgitation and a low mean gradient of about five. So that is our first line, is to treat medically, unless it's severe or unless there's pulmonary embolism or something more complicated than that. Будьте добры, насколько менялась картина при э, наличии вот, э, биоклапана или кондуита при исследовании э, МРТ, МРИ? How change the door? Okay, okay, yeah, I, we, we prefer CT. Uh, we have less artifact um, from uh, stents or from the bioprosthetic valves. But when those are present, it, it, does, it can limit the uh, precision of knowing where the coronary arteries are located. So in cases like that, we still get the CT, um, but then we perform um, coronary artery angiography at the time of catheterization. Thank you very much. Uh, Скажите, пожалуйста, вы говорите о том, что показания для протезирования клапана легочной артерии вы оцениваете в основном по МРТ и индекс КДО больше 150-170. Нет ли у вас практики использования эхокардиографии 2D Strain технологии для более ранней выявления дисфункции правого желудочка и, может быть, более агрессивной позиции по протезированию клапана? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So we, we certainly use echocardi echocardiography routinely, at least every year on these patients. And, but, but we don't, um, we think that echo is limited in the ability to, add, to precisely measure the size of the right ventricle. So uh, MRI is the only thing that's really been validated to measure the volume of the right ventricle. But certainly on echo, comparing from year to year, we can get a sense of progression in the size of the right ventricle that may prompt us to uh, perform an MRI sooner. And to be honest, in, in smaller children, when we can see the right ventricle is enlarged, we often don't get the MRI. We, we, we can sometimes make a decision to treat based upon the subjective appearance of it by echo. Я вот ждал этого вопроса, потому что как бы я ждал от кардиологов этого вопроса, а почему-то одни от хирургов поступают вопросы, кардиологи сидят и молчат, вы все знаете, да, то есть у меня первый был вопрос, который бы задал кардиолог, наверное, ну, по моему разумению, почему все время в докладе слышится средний градиент давления? У нас в России все пишут пиковые градиенты, и никто средние градиенты не мерит, не измеряет. Поэтому вот я ждал от кардиолога да, вопрос, а почему в своем докладе вчера по аорте, а сегодня по э, легочному клапану всегда использовал слово средний градиент, а не пиковый градиент. Почему используют вот так? Um, so that's a very good question. The, there are a couple of reasons for that. The, the easiest answer is that it, the mean gradient for right ventricular apical tract obstruction aortic valve stenosis, coarctation, uh, correlates better with the catheter-derived gradient, which is what has been used historically. The reason for that is probably a few things. Um, generally, with catheterization, patients are sedated, so the gradient may be lower than when they're awake. Uh, the other reason is that the peak gradient by Doppler is different than the peak-to-peak -peak gradient by echo. The, um, the, I, I, excuse me, I said that right, the peak-to-peak -peak gradient by cat. Um, at catheterization, the peak gradient, for example, in the main pulmonary artery uh, is later than the peak gradient in the right ventricular outflow tract. And so it, it's, not a, it's not a simultaneous measurement as it is with Doppler. And so you do get an exaggeration of the maximum gradient um, by echo relative to the peak-to-peak -peak gradient by cath, if that makes sense. 
И второй вопрос, спасибо на этом. Я ждал, как вот Павел задал, а дисфункция правого желудочка, да, когда одно из показаний дисфункция правого желудочка. И я ждал вопроса от кардиологов, какой должен быть, какие показатели этой дисфункции, да? Вы все тоже знаете, да? То есть читали все статьи, все не знаете, да? А почему не спрашиваете? Владимир Владимирович, я призывал, больше вопросов. Ну ладно. Yeah. Well, the right ventricular dysfunction is, is again a very difficult thing to assess. Ironically, for as much as congenital heart disease is focused on the right heart, we're not very good at assessing the right heart. Um, and so again, it's, by echo, it's a subjective uh, measurement. By MRI, we can calculate, if you believe it, an ejection fraction. Still one question, sorry. And what is with regard to QRS lengths? Скажите, длина QRS, как как считать КДО, какое КДО оптимально для защиты правого желудочка в отдаленные сроки? И сколько клапанов можно поставить максимально? Три, четыре, один в один? So two questions. One was about the QRS duration. Uh, the, the QRS duration is a difficult one to answer, uh, especially in patients who have had a BSD closure, for example. Um, so the QRS duration will be prolonged in, after BSD closure or a transannular patch, independent of the right ventricular size. So we, we in, in tetralogy, that has been shown to correlate with mortality and with risk of arrhythmia, but we still rely on the um, the appearance of the right ventricle, either by echo or by MRI, not just by the QRS duration. And then the second question is how many valves can we implant? Um, with, with conduits in theory, we're, we're limited by how much we can dilate the stents that we already have put in. Uh, we know that we can put in at least two valves in conduits, uh, hopefully three or more. We, I don't know that people have had that much experience to know yet because it is a new technology, a recent technology. The downside to the bioprosthetic valves is those are limited. You can't stretch them any more than their nominal size. And so depending upon how big it is, hopefully we can put in two, maybe three if a large valve is, has been placed in a smaller child, um, but that will limit. Uh, and again, as Dr. Seta said, the goal is not to avoid any surgery in the future. The goal is to postpone the next operation as long as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Very good question. So the question of symptoms and how do we interpret symptoms since most patients are asymptomatic. Um, I, I think that uh, that's why we tend to rely on these, the, the gradients and the size of the right ventricle to determine whether we should intervene. I think we have good data to tell us when to intervene for pulmonary insufficiency. I think we don't have good data to tell us when to intervene for pulmonary stenosis. Um, and so we make up numbers. We say 40 millimeters of mercury or 45 millimeters of mercury. Um, I think the, the opposite of that question is, do patients feel better afterwards? Um, and those who have symptoms tend to feel better, but we don't have a control group. It could be a placebo effect. Of course I feel better because you did this procedure. Whereas objectively, maybe they don't feel uh, better, or maybe they don't perform better on exercise testing. So it's a very good question that I don't have a good answer for. Спасибо, Нейтан.